Acts chapter number 20. I know half of you guys think I'm a visitor because I cut my hair off my head, but uh, uh, I got tired of it. I was on the radio recently and I had that afro and I put the, uh, it felt like a helmet on my head, the, the headphones on my head. And uh, I got up, left out of the, the, uh, the office, out of the, the studio. And I walked around all day. We were doing some crazy stuff over next door. I don't know what we were doing, but I walked around all day. I got home, and my wife starts, you know, dying laughing. She's rolling around, you know, just a gut buster. Uh, and uh, I said, what's funny? And she said, well, I can't tell you right now. And, uh, and uh, she didn't want to tell me, but uh, I had this indentation in my head uh, across my whole head all day. And I was like, okay. Uh, all of the guys in RU home are going to leave me out here hanging like this. It's all good. Uh, I'm going to call Dave Talbot and uh, have him uh, make sure that we get rid of half of these cats because they saw me like this. So I got mad and I said, let me cut it and uh, got the best barber in the world. He cut me up, uh, cut my hair down and uh, got me back to feeling normal. I'm used to having low hair on my head anyway. So praise God for it. We're going to be in Acts chapter number 20 tonight. Acts chapter number 20. This is a uh, joyous opportunity for me. I love it. I appreciate it. Uh, I definitely miss Pastor Wilkerson. In, face, in fact, my face lit up when I saw him uh, appear on the screen. And uh, I just love him, love him, love him. And uh, I remember his first day of being the pastor here, he came to my house. On the first day he was here and visited me and Shonda before we ever had Jayla, Ace, and Ezra. And uh, he showed us love from day one. And uh, he's continued on, and uh, sometimes I don't understand why, but uh, he, he, he loves us, and we love him and his wife and his kids, and we appreciate everything that uh, he does for us and how he pushes us in the Lord. When I first came to this building, it was about almost 14 years ago. I was 20, year, 20 years old. I had just got saved in July 2009. And I came to this building, I sat right there in the balcony on this side here, and I heard a sermon preached about not being politically correct. And, uh, and I said, I've never in my life, hear me clearly, I said, I've never in my life knew that white people knew how to preach. I'm telling you, <laughs> I did it. Gosh, I'm serious, man. I didn't know when I grew up on the west side of Chicago. I've never, I didn't know. Uh, but I was amazed. And uh, I started coming, and, uh, and uh, God just began to really uh, push me and push me and push me to do things that I couldn't have ever imagined that I would do. In fact, uh, preaching is not something that I would have ever guessed that I would have done. Um, in fact, when I first became a preacher, if you want to call it that, I did not want to tell people that I was a preacher. Yeah, anybody that's a preacher, you know your first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seven, eight, nine, tenth sermon are just absolutely horrible. Uh, the worst sermons on the planet, you guys know. And so, because my sermons were so bad then, I said, no, I'm not a preacher, man. I just, I just serve the Lord. That's how I used to put it. I'll just serve the Lord. And, uh, but God uh, kept pushing me. And uh, he was seeing young people my way. Uh, Brother Marcus Trawick, he's an old man now. He's married and got two children and uh, comes to Sunday school class with us, serves with us. I don't know what I would do uh, without his assistance, him and his wife. Uh, but he was a kid when I met him. And uh, for him to be married and, and doing what he's doing for the Lord is just absolutely unbelievable. And God used him in my life and others, David West, and different young people that God would use to push me to get me to where he wanted me to be. And then the Lord uh, began to move me and my wife around the country. We went and helped with several different church plants. And... Uh, Everything that uh, everybody's invested in us is just absolutely unbelievable. Uh, when they couldn't see uh, what we would be, uh, they saw where we were going, and they said, we're just going to invest because we believe in you. And uh, I'm so grateful for it, and I appreciate every person that's invested in our lives here in this building. And then, of course, my wife, she disappeared out of the room. Come on, Shonda, I'm trying to give you a compliment, babe. Wherever you are, I got to find you. I got to figure out where you are. You got to at least show your face so I can uh, compliment you, babe. Come on now. Uh, that's, that's, my, that's my ace boon coon. I wouldn't be able to do anything uh, without this woman. I promise you I wouldn't. Uh, I could not do what I do without 
uh, my beautiful wife, uh, the fairest of 10,000. Where are you, Shonda? I'm trying to hook you up here, babe. Come on. Uh, but uh, God has been good in giving me her, and, uh, and then God went a step further and gave me Jayla and Asa and Ezra. Uh, just unimaginable things in my life. Uh, I'd have to take you guys on a trip with me out to the west side of Chicago sometimes and uh, show you where I came from and show you the sheer impossibility of me standing here and speaking to you tonight. But God, not that I was faithful to the Lord, not that I was anything special, but God said, I want to use this young man. And uh, I, I'm amazed at what God has done. I thank you, First Baptist Church, for all of your investment in me. I'm taking too much time. I got to preach, y'all. I'm sorry. I got a brief, a brief, I got a brief homily for you tonight in Acts chapter number 20. Here we go. Acts chapter number 20. I am aware of the lateness of the hour. I am aware that there are two games going on. There's a Cubs game going on, and then the Golden State Warriors are paying, playing the Celtics. because I'm aware. And, uh, but we're going to be just like we're in Acts chapter number 20 tonight. So let's read verse number 7. Won't you stand with me? Acts chapter number 20 and verse number 7. <clears throat> Acts chapter number 7, uh, 20, sorry. Acts chapter 20, verse number 7. The Bible should say, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to bake, break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. Good luck, y'all. <laughs> and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in the window a certain young man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep and as Paul was long preaching, he was sunken down in, with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and fell upon him and embracing him said, trouble not yourselves for his life is in him. When he then, when he, excuse me, when he therefore was come, upon, come up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, <laughs> even till daybreak, so he departed. We in for a long night, y'all. We missing every game tonight. And they brought the young man alive and were not little comforted. For a few moments, I want to talk to you from the subject, if you don't mind. It's late, but don't fall asleep. Look at somebody next to you and say, it's late, but don't fall asleep. I'm sorry, I got y'all on that one. You're not used to that one. So let me try it again. It sounds like half the crowd was asleep. So let me wake you up with it one more time. Look at somebody on the other side of you and say, I know it's late, but don't fall asleep. You may be seated. I'm going to pray. Lord, we sure do thank you for today. We thank you for your word. We thank you for what you've given us in the scripture. We thank you for being our God. We thank you for saving us. We thank you, Lord, that you will prayerfully give the understanding tonight. Lord, anything that I'm going to say is nothing new. This is your word and not mine. I pray, God, that you would hide me behind it. I pray, God, that I would not say anything that would help or hinder or hurt or hinder the work of God here in this place. I pray, God, that I would not say anything that will hurt or hinder the work of our under-shepherd, Pastor Wilkerson. I pray, God, that you would guide my lips. I also pray, God, that you would be reckless without my permission. I pray, God, that you would use us in a mighty way. God, to be honest with you, I have no confidence in the flesh. So, therefore, we're trusting you tonight. I pray that you would guide us. Everything that you showed me in this text, I pray, God, that you would accomplish it here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. We're going to talk about sleeping in church tonight. It's going to be real good. Hopefully somebody does not go to sleep in church because I don't want you to be the sermon example. I'm coming down right to you. This story is situated in Acts chapter number 20. The Bible talks about how 
the people of God met together on the first day of the week. This is the first time in the biblical text, in the scripture, where we see where they actually met on the first day of the week. But this was a unique service because this was a night service similar to what we have going on now. And the Bible says that the guest preacher came and he began to speak the word of God. And he got so carried away with the word of God that he just continued preaching until midnight. He just let go. And the people of God had nothing to say about it. They were just like, come on, brother, you're pushing it. And I came to tell you tonight that he wasn't preaching about himself. He wasn't preaching about his government. I'm trying to tell you, I know that he was preaching about the lovely Lord Jesus Christ. And if you get connected to that thing, it's hard to let loose. He began to speak vehemently about the Lord Jesus Christ. It was so much in, uh, enthralled in his spirit that he could not stop preaching. Now, I don't plan on doing that tonight, but I do plan on preaching about Jesus for a few moments. He began to speak about Jesus, and as he's speaking, the Bible says that there's a young man who was sitting in the window. In our vernacular, he was chilling in the window. And he was sitting on this window, and as he was sitting on this window, Paul is preaching his heart out, and he's pouring himself into uh, the people of God there, and he's telling them everything that God has poured into him. And Paul just spent three months, the Bible says, in another place, and then he sent some guys ahead of him to come to Troas to wait up on him for him to get there a five days journey, and then he stayed in Troas for seven days. And it's the last night of his revival and something happens in his spirit where he says, evidently, I'm not going to see these people again. So everything that I have inside of me, I'm going to give it to them. And I don't want to leave nothing undone that what God has put inside of me, so I'm going to tell them what I have. And the people of God were ready. They received what he had. But it was a young man who was sitting in a window. The Bible says he began to go to sleep. He shut those eyes. And I can imagine the cool air blowing up on him. And you know, uh, the cool air is blowing and boy, he began to relax those shoulders. And the Bible says Paul just keeps preaching and preaching and preaching. And the more he preached, the more relaxed this young man became. And I mean, he's sitting in that thing, and I mean, he probably had a little snort come out, and he began to breathe a little deeper, and oh, Lord, he, Lord, I'm fighting the best I can to try to stay woke. I know what the preacher's saying is really good, but I'm being overwhelmed right now with sleep. It's, it's, just, it's just happening to me. The Bible says he began to sink down a little bit more in his sleep. He sunk down so much so that he had come to a, ple a complete place of unconsciousness. And as he is unconscious, he's sitting in this window, and Paul is preaching, and Paul is preaching, and he's just long-winded. Lord, have mercy. Paul, you got to stop at some point. <laughs> Respect the people's time, Dr. Paul. And he's preaching. In the middle of his preaching... This young man falls out of this window. This was a great fall. He fell from the third floor. He fell from the third floor and he died while Paul was preaching. Woo. I couldn't imagine preaching to you tonight and somebody sitting up on the third floor and they fall and die. I wonder what my reaction would be. I wonder what your reaction would be. <laughs> I'm sure it would be mass chaos in the building. And just like I believe it would be mass chaos in the building, it was mass chaos there, so much so that the Bible says that Paul had to leave what he was doing, ran down to the young man, fell up on him, embraced him, and said, listen, calm down, everybody. His life is in him. Paul goes back says, I'm starting from where I left off and starts preaching all night long <laughs> till daybreak. Break bread, that's what the Bible says, not mine. They break bread 
And he begins to preach, and they brought the young man alive, and the Bible says they were not little comforted. In other words, they were comforted a whole lot once they saw the young man's life restored. That's the story. I can go home now. I'm done. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Looking at this text, I know some would say, James, you could just preach this text to young people because this was a young man sitting in the window. And you could preach to young people why they shouldn't go to sleep in church. You should be able to tell them they shouldn't go to sleep in church because they'll miss the truths of the church. They shouldn't go to sleep at church because their participation is needed at church. Young people shouldn't go to sleep at church because they are susceptible to a fall. How about that one? Young people, you shouldn't go to sleep at church because you may fall out of church. Young people, perhaps you shouldn't go to sleep at church because you'll lose your vitality, the life that God gave you to use for him. You'll lose it. Watch this. Young people perhaps shouldn't go to sleep at church because if they do and they fall out of a window or they fall out of church and they die, it's going to affect them and everybody else. Somebody preached that on your bus route tonight. Have fun with it. It's not what I'm going to preach about tonight. I am going to talk about this young man in his sleep. Then I'm going to talk about the young man in his seat. Then I'd like to venture over a little bit and lean into it from a different way and talk about his relief. And then for a few minutes at the end of the message here, I just want to talk briefly about everything that happened to that young man, how it turned up the heat in the church. Let's get with it, okay? Can I go to work, y'all? If y'all don't mind, y'all going to work with me? I know some of y'all looking at me like, can this man preach or what? I'm just asking, can anybody help me preach? That's what I need to know. Let me give you the definition of this word, sleep. Sleep means the state in which a voluntary exertion of mental and corporal powers is suspended. And what one person rests unconscious of what passes around them. And not, they are not affected by the ordinary impressions of external objects. Y'all know Brother Abdel preaches a sermon. He used this term in there, somnambulism. You guys heard it before. About this young man who knows how to, he's doing things, but he's sleep. His body's moving, but he's sleep. You guys know, y'all have heard Pastor Abdel preach it. Am I right about it? Somnambulism. He tells a story about the young man being in the camp with him. <laughs> I love it in his pajamas, walking around, <laughs> sleep. Unconscious, not aware of his surroundings. A lot of people are there tonight. <sighs> this young man went to sleep because he was young. I know how it is. Young people, certain things are unimportant to them. The young man, I'm not going to stay on this sleep thing for too long. I got to move on. The young man went to sleep. Probably because he was bored. Come on, you can say amen. amen. You know boredom is contagious. <laughs> Just like excitement is. Somebody's excited, guess what happens? It gets you excited. Somebody's bored, it gets you bored. Let one person in this room yawn, the next person, the people next to him are going to start yawning. It's going to be a yawn fest in this thing. He fell asleep. Because he was young and he was unable to control his senses. He had no control of himself. And so he didn't understand the urgency of what was going on, perhaps. He didn't understand that, yeah, this guest preacher, he's put in all of this work. Any person that can preach from here to midnight is there. That's a bad man. You got to have a lot of word in you to preach that long. But he falls to sleep, and he has no willpower to push through. A lot of commentators, as they write about this, and they, they, put notes on, uh, they put notes about this text here, they talk about how the young man falls asleep, 
and they honestly believed that it was somewhat the work of Satan. Because Paul was well known in the area. This was his third missionary journey. He was on his way back to where he was going. And he was going to pass by here one more time. And he was coming to preach. And he was going to give the people a word. And Satan knew this. And if he knew that if, I could, if, if Paul would get these people the word of God, it could change their whole life. And so Satan says, I'm going to stir this young man and I'm going to put the pressure on him. I'm going to make sure that the atmosphere is real nice. You know, it was a lot of people in this, this loft. This wasn't like our church where we would think of a third floor where we got all of this down here and then the third floor. This was a upper room, if you will. If you go to Jerusalem, you'll get a chance, and whoever goes on this Israel trip, you'll get a chance to see the upper room. It's a room with, uh, that Jesus ate the Last Supper in. It's a room with, 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 uh, with, with pillars in it, and it's cascading stones that's going up into the ceiling. It's a wide but a flat stone floor. And when you speak in the room, your voice echoes, and your voice is, you can be heard from anywhere in the room. It's a beautiful room. It's got windows in it. And on these pillars, there are two, four, six, eight lamps on each pillar. And there's plenty of pillars in the room. And in this room, the, the pillars, the, on the pillars there are lamps, and these, these lamps began to heat up the room. And it just got warm in the room because it was so many bodies in the room. They didn't have AC like we do. We get to enjoy that. But it was so many bodies in the room because they came to hear what Paul had to say. They knew that the man walked with God. They knew that God had transformed his life. They knew that whatever he had to say to them, it was going to make a difference. And they came and they packed the place out and they said, whatever you have to say, Paul, we're listening. And the heat in the room, I guess, began to really mess with the young man. And the crowdedness of the room in the lateness of the night, when you look up the word sleep, the definition of the word sleep, the very first definition says that you should, sleep should be done at night. <laughs> this young man began to sleep because the lateness of the hour, it was late. It was late. It was perhaps somebody sitting next to him or around him. He peeped. He said, man, if they're taking the nap over there, I think I can uh, get away with just closing my eyes on that one scripture that he was talking about. I think I know that one already, so I'm going to go ahead and close my eyes down. And the heat in the room began to overtake the young man. The definition of what was written there in the scripture was that he was being borne down with sleep. He was trying to wrestle his way out of it, but he couldn't. Commentators, as I said, they think that Satan had something to do with this because they wanted to put a damper on the ministry of Paul. They wanted to stop the preaching. Satan said, hey, this is enough. We don't want that here. It was good, but it's midnight now, buddy. And he puts a damper on the room by causing this young man to go to sleep. And then the young man falls out of the window. Now, I could have purposely preached a whole sermon about sleeping in church, but I'm going to ease up off of you. If you fall asleep in church, that's on you. <laughs> what I'm most interested in in this text what drew my attention in the text is not that he was asleep. I feel you, you sleep, man. You just got through with the love feast and everything. They just broke bread here in the text. They just broke bread. That's what the Bible says in verse number seven. They just got through eating. You know when you, when you eat, you get the itis and you start fading away. Tonight after I eat, I want some, uh, what do I want tonight? Some fried catfish and some cornbread and some collard greens. And come on, come on, come on, come on. Y'all know what it is. Uh, candy yams and baked macaroni and then I need a tall glass of sweet tea with that and you know when you eat you know how it is when you eat you, you, start, you start fading away boy that body starts shutting down on you it was late and he had ate his belly was full and the room was warm and he just began to go to sleep my issue is not that he was sleeping 
It's cool, man. Everybody takes a nap here and there in the church. Come on now. Y'all seen it. Uh, Brother Moses, you've seen some people nod off at church. Man, I was in the church here a couple months ago here, and I mean, somebody was getting at it sleeping. Uh, I mean, had spread their arms out, and I mean, was head back just going at it. Just, I mean, letting her rip. I mean, somebody had to go smack them like, get up, get up, get up, get up. And they woke up. It's other people that sleep here. I know the ladies with the big bags. I know what you got in the bag. You got a blanket in there. And what you do is you throw it on your lap and you warm those legs up. And uh, by the time those legs get warm, the, the eyes start shutting down and the head start bobbing. And uh, here's the best one. The people that uh, like to sleep and they pretend like they're praying. I know better than that. <laughs> you ain't praying. <laughs> you sleep. You're getting you a quick one in. <laughs> I feel him. He was asleep. I'm not going to be too hard on this young man. I'm not going to be hard on him. He was asleep in the room. Let me tell you why I'm not going to be too hard on him, because he was, why he was asleep. First of all, he's a young man, and he was in the church. Not normal. He's a young man, Brother Moses, and he was at church. Here is the potential that's in this text. It's packed. Even though the young man was asleep, at least he was in the right place. Because at any moment he could have woke up and he could have heard the truth. And his whole life could have transformed when he woke up. So now my issue is not really with him sleeping. It's cool. Go ahead. Take a nap, buddy. At least you, I mean, get you whatever. This might be the only time you get a chance to take a nap. Do your thing, man. Do your thing. He takes a nap, and my issue, I still ain't told you my issue with the text yet. <laughs> my issue is not that he was asleep. My issue is where he was seated. Eutychus, why in the world would you take a seat on a window? Dude, you could have sat anywhere. Why take a seat on the window? Well, the text has some micro information there for us. And if we read too fast, I tell these guys this often, if you read too fast, you're going to miss what the Lord is saying. So let's slow down and look at what the Bible says in verse number, what is that, eight? Verse number eight. Verse number nine. The ver Bible says, and there sat in a window a certain young man named Eutychus. He sat in the seat. He made the window into his seat because he was young. Young men make dumb decisions. Somebody say amen. amen. Young people make bad decisions. And so instead of him getting a better pew seat, instead of him sitting next to somebody who can nudge him if he's woke, he said, I'm going to sit in a window. It was just a bad decision that this young man made. Yep. Eutychus, come on, man. You could have sat anywhere. All the seats that in the room you would have chosen, you choose the window. Come on, man. You don't see that sitting in this window is going to hurt you, do you? Look at the text in verse number nine. Look what it says. The Bible says that there sat a young man, a certain, as they sat in the window, a certain young man named Eutychus being fallen into a deep sleep. And as Paul was long preaching, he was sunk down with sleep and fell down from the uh, third loft and was taken up dead. This young man, perhaps he sat in the window because of his name. Y'all ain't with me yet, so I got to bring you up to what I'm talking about. This man's name literally means fortunate. This man's name means well off. He liked to play Russian, Russian roulette. I'm fortunate. I'm well off. So I can do whatever I want to do. He takes the seat in this window, and he falls out of it. Eutychus, come on, guy. Why? 
Let me tell you what he's doing while he's in this window. He sits in this window and he's purposely perched there. Let me tell you why he's perched in the window. The purpose of a window is so that I can be in one place and I can look in another place. This young man, listen to me carefully, took this seat on the window because he was not fully committed. He didn't want to be involved in what was going on in the body. Listen, his person was here, but he was peeping what was going on out in the world. Y'all ain't with me. Y'all playing with me like you don't understand what I'm saying. Listen, his flesh was in the church, but his feelings were outside of the church. Listen, y'all still ain't with me. His substance was here in the seat, in the window, but listen, his sight was out there. This young man took his seat in the window because he was interested on what was going on out there. He knew how to look while he was in the church building, but he was still looking somewhere else outside of the church building. He was precariously perched in this spot because he had a desire to be out there. Eutychus, why would you sit in the window? I'm sitting in the window, Brother James, because my sight was focused on the outside world. Yes, I was in the church, but I really wasn't there. My sight was out there. My heart was out there. There are people in this room tonight yes. Help us. sitting in here, suit, tie, dress, dress shoes, looking good, feeling good, looking the part, acting the part, but literally your heart is outside. You came here. Yes thinking that you can fool the rest of us. Come on. But God knew Amen. that your heart is not here. Amen. And listen to me, you are dangerously perched up on a window and you're going to fall. Come on. This thing is no joke. Come on. Young people make bad decisions. So he decides to perch himself in a window because he was young, he decided to make a bad decision. Perhaps his name led to why he was sitting in that seat. He sits in the seat because that's where his interest is. It's on the outside world. But here it is. I'm getting ready to come around with a haymaker. I praise y'all duck. Get ready to duck. Here's my question. This young man is sitting in a window. He's sitting there. And eventually, he sit there so, sits there so long that he falls into a deep sleep. He was sleeping a little bit, but then he falls into a deep sleep, eventually falls out of the window, and nobody, nobody, nobody in the whole body is interested. Nobody is intrigued by this young man sitting in the window. Nobody. You say, Brother James, well, what made you come up with that question? The text did. Look at verse number 10. Verse number 9, I'm sorry. And verse number 8, sorry. <laughs> the Bible says in verse number 8, and there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. You mean to tell me that this young man was sitting in this window, falling asleep, falls into a deep sleep and falls out of the window and nobody sees him? I must look like my name, I got Boo Boo the Fool written across my forehead here. <laughs> Y'all ain't getting me yet. Luke wrote this. He is very detailed in what he writes. He says that there were many lights in the room. Light in the Bible always represents truth. <laughs> Lights in the Bible always represents truth. 
You remember where Christ said that ye are the light of the world? You and I are the light of the world. So I guess what this text is teaching me is that it's possible for people to come to church, be in the body, sitting on the edge, and fall out because people, other people in the church are so interested in themselves. They're so interested in their truth that they don't notice the young man and they don't do anything about it. I told y'all y'all was going to have to duck this one. You wasn't expecting that. The text says there was many lights in the room. Somebody saw the young man in the window. Somebody could have prevented the young man from falling if they would have just said something. If somebody would have just made themselves accountable to the young man, he wouldn't have failed. He would have been pulled off of the window. Perhaps somebody would have woke him up and they saw him nodding in the window. But everybody else was so comfortable in receiving the truth from the conference. You know, the special preacher was here, so we're just so focused on the conference and the truth that's going on there that we don't have time to really pay attention to the parishioners around us. We got to be careful. God has given us a body of believers, and we are responsible for their well-being. Not just them being saved, but we're responsible for them to continue walking with God. I take responsibility upon myself to make sure that people that come here walk with God. And if I see them slipping, hey, bro, you slipping, dude. You need to, I don't know if you're going to take my advice or not. You might not. But in love, I'm trying to tell you, bro, you're going the wrong direction. Do what you, do what you will with that. It's time that churches begin to take responsibility for people that enter their doors. Yes. This young man fell out of the window and the partial part of the blame, yes, it was on himself, but a good part of the blame was up on the rest of the people in the church. He falls out of this window and he didn't have to fall out of the window. You know, God is not glorying when he sees people fall out of church. God is not satisfied with that. God is not happy with that. It's not God's will for people to fall out of church. Jesus Christ came and died for the church. Why would he want somebody to fall out of something he died for? We don't glory when people fall out of church. We should be trying to seek and find them and bring them back. That's our job as Christian believers. We need to seek people that's fallen away and draw them back to God. I love this text. Light. It removes darkness. They had no excuse for not seeing them. Nobody could say wasn't enough light in the room. See, Luke, the physician, was very detailed when he wrote this. He says it was many lights in the room. Therefore, the church had no excuse to let this young man fall out of the window. Y'all remember God's response to Cain when he killed Abel and by my brother's keeper? (laughs) Why would I keep my brother? God wasn't happy. God was not pleased with that response. I am my brother's keeper. There was so much truth in the room And nobody notices this young man on the edge. Nobody notices that this young man is about to fall. Let's not let let it not be said of this church, this body, that there are people that are sitting on the edge and we can see it and we did nothing about it. We didn't say a word about it. Let us not get together in our groups. And begin to say, I knew he was going to fall. I knew he was going to fall out of church. I knew they was going to walk away from God. Listen, if you do that, I'm going to pull a Pastor Wilkson. You need a check up from the neck up. It's something wrong with you. If you glory in a brother in Christ, a sister in Christ, it's something wrong with you if you take glory in that. That's not the way of God. 
God is not interested in that. He's so far away from that. That's my pride when I look at somebody, because listen to me carefully, but for the grace of God, there go I out of the window. You grew up on the west side of Chicago, and I'll tell you why you got people falling out of windows there. You grew up with no hope. You grew up with nobody telling you you're going to do anything. You grew up with just barely making it through high school. Every day you go in school, somebody's bullying you. Somebody, you got to fight your way out. You grow up and people tell you that I'm jumping on you. We're going to jump a six, seven of us going to beat you up today. And I'll tell you why these young people fall away from God. It's our job that even though the young person makes a bad decision, it's our job to be their accountability partner. That's right. If nobody else says anything to you, I really don't care if it offends you, young blood. I'm going to tell you the facts. Let me tell you why I don't care. Because when Brother James was out in the world, Satan didn't care what he told me. Come on. That's good. He didn't care. He knew that whatever he would offer me would cause destruction. And he would call me out of my name. He would cause me to take in substances that would alter my thinking. He would cause me to make really foolish and bad decisions. But somebody cared enough to say, young man, dude, you're going down the wrong path. Come on. Come on. Yes. Hey, man, hook up with me. Come with me. Follow me, bro, to down the right path, the narrow way. Yeah. Follow me down the straight road. Somebody looked out for me. Amen. Listen to you. You do not get where I am preaching to you right now if somebody else didn't look out for me first. That's right. Somebody said, I'm going to be accountable for James Anderson to make sure he gets where God wants him to be. And I see him making dangerous decisions, and I'm just going to be bold enough to say, bro, that's dumb. Bro, that's ignorant. Bro, you're going to hurt yourself, and you're going to hurt your family if you make this decision. Are you responsible today? It's unique because when I was in gangs, messing around with the gangs on the west side of Chicago, we were all hand in hand, ride or die is what we would say. I know a lot of you guys can't relate to that. You've not been in the gang. But a lot of you have served in the military. And you would put your life on the line for your brother. You would put your life on the line. If you saw your brother in the military in danger, you would risk yourself to help them. You don't care how upset they might get with you saving them. You don't care about how it makes them feel. You're saying, no, I'm going to put myself, I'm going to throw myself on whatever it is to save you. Well, if you had that, 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 that mentality in the military, you need to have the same mentality for the word of God, for the people of God. I love this text, y'all. The Lord wore me out with this text. I'm trying to tell you. I said, God, why are you doing this to me? <laughs> you convicted me, Lord. I don't want to be convicted right now. <laughs> Convict me tomorrow. <laughs> Look what the Bible says here. This is, I just absolutely love this passage right here, this portion right here, verse number 10. I love it. I love it. This shows us the work of the, the spiritual work of the church. Watch it. Verse 10. And Paul went down and fell on him, embracing him. He said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. I guess if I could take this text and sum it up and give you a thesis, here's what it would be, especially to my guys right here. Listen, just because you fail does not mean that it has to be fatal. Just because you fail does not mean that your life is over. Watch the spiritual work of Paul here in the text. The Bible says, I want you to read, listen, we're not going to skip over one word here because I want you to see what happens. The Bible says that Paul went down, fell upon him, embraced him. Lord, have mercy, help me out. Silas, meet me, meet me right here. Silas, meet me right here. Paul, stay right there, Silas. Paul had witnessed, evidently, that he heard the uproar about this young man falling out a window. 
And the Bible says that this young man was taken up dead. Now, I can give credence to it. I believe he was dead. Why do I believe he was dead? Because a physician wrote it. Luke wrote this. And if he know, if anybody knows who's dead, Paul, Luke would know who's dead. The Bible says this young man was taken up dead. He was dead for sure. Dead as a doorknob. He was dead, dead. There was no comeback. But the Bible says that Paul stopped what he was doing. He stopped his spiritual work. He stopped preaching. He stopped worshiping at that moment. He stopped doing everything that he was doing. The Bible says that he came down, fell upon this man, Embrace him. It's in the Bible. Don't get mad at me. Somebody else looked at the man, and they all agreed that he was dead. There was no life left in him. There was nothing in him that was worth using. Everything about him had been complete. Y'all don't believe he was dead. If you fall out of a third floor window, tell you what will happen to you. You fall out of a third floor window, more than likely, you're going to fall on your shoulders, crack your skull, or break your back. I've read many incidences studying from this. I've read real-life incidences of what happened to people when they fall from a third floor. It's what happens. Crack skull, shattered skull, or spine is completely broken. Everything is out of alignment. Everybody else looked at the young man and said, what just happened to him is impossible for him to come back. It's impossible. You cannot put a skull back together. His spinal cord is not aligned. It would take such a tedious practitioner and physician to put this man's spine back into place. That is impossible for him to have life after this. But Paul, the spiritual man, sees the issue and he sees the moment. And he says, I'm going to run myself down here. And in this text, this is a strange text because the Bible says he ran down, fell upon him, embraced him. The Bible did not say that this man prayed. The Bible did not say that he preached a sermon. The Bible did not say he spoke and said, get up. The Bible says he put his, what he was preaching into practice. <laughs> Let me ask this question. How easy is it for you to embrace somebody who you would consider dead weight. It's people in your family who you've counted out. And you look at them and says, because they fell out of church and fell away from God, it's over with for them. And you've given up on them. But the spiritual man The Bible says, the work of the spiritual man in Galatians says, ye which are spiritual (laughs) are to restore people who have fallen. That's our job. That's the word, man. Don't play me. That's the word. It's not James thinking. That's the word. Paul shows us this. I knew it was something happening here because there's nothing special about what he did. He just went down and hugged him. He embraced him. And that single embrace brought life back to the young man. Sometimes people don't need another sermon. They don't need you to preach the gospel to them 500 times because they failed. They just need an embrace. They need a loving hug, an arm, an open arm, say, come on, man, I know you failed, but God got you. We love you here. We're here to care for you. We're not just with you when you're on the up and up. But listen to me. We know the world is not going to be with you when you fall, but we're going to be here with you. There's a young man right now as I speak. He's down in Tennessee. His mom had a stroke on uh, Friday. 
It's Friday, right, Dave? Friday's mom had a stroke. He came here with issues. Everybody that comes over to our home is, is normal to us. I know people try to tell us everything about the person. We just say, hey, they got issues. We're here to help them out with whatever it is. It, you, no matter what you tell us, it's not going to make us change our mind about them. We're accepting them in. It is what it is. Nothing, they, nothing they've done, nothing that they do. You know, They can smoke whatever, drink whatever. When they get here, we're here to take them in and help them. It's what the church has this ministry for. This young man comes in our door, and he's standing up on the second floor in the loft area there, the lobby area there. And uh, he says, uh, man, I don't know how I got here. I really don't know why I'm here. I mean, he was here for five minutes. And this man began to break down in some serious tears. And you know what we did? We did not tell him, wait till I preach this sermon for you tonight. Mm, come on. Yes. We did not tell him, wait till you hear the, go to church on Wednesday. You know what we did? There's four of us standing there. Every one of us grabbed the man and squeezed him as tight as we could. Not knowing him from a pan, a can of paint. We knew he needed the love of God. And the only way that he was going to experience the love of God is if a person gave it to him. So we squeezed him till he couldn't cry anymore. He came in here 45 pounds lighter. He's, he's been eating. <laughs> Our embrace is what kept the man here. Before he ever heard a single word about God, before he ever heard a single sermon, before he ever heard anything... He got an embrace from the people of God. I guess my question is, when was the last time you embraced somebody that's not like you? That's good. I got to finish, finish this sermon. I'm done, y'all. I'm done. I promise you I'm done. But I would be amiss as a preacher if I did not bring this home to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so in conclusion... My appeal is fourfold. I wish Sister Colston would hit me with E flat over there on the preacher court. <laughs> That'd be good. <laughs> My appeal is to. Uh oh. <laughs> Come on. Woo! Lord, y'all about to. Sister Colston, don't do that. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That was good. <laughs> you got me off track here, Sister Coast. <laughs> I was not expecting that one. <laughs> My appeal is first of all to the unsaved. We just read a story about a young man whose name is Eutychus. In our language, is fortunate. He fell, and he died because of the decision he's made. But a spiritual man came down three stories up. He fell down, and he embraced death. Y'all not with me yet. Lord, I, I really want to preach here again, so help me to control myself here. <laughs> Tonight you came here and you're not saved. You don't know God. You don't know Christ, but you came searching for him. There's a man named Jesus Christ who came from the third heaven. The Bible says that he fell and he died and was buried. And he rose again. He embraced death. And he rose again from the grave so that you might live. He wants you to know him. He's really not concerned about you going to a place with him, but, but more concerned about you being with him and his father. You're unsaved tonight, and my appeal is to you. I plead with you. You're sitting on the window. It's called eternity, and you can fall out of it at any moment. Please don't play with God. Can I be your accountability partner today if you're unsaved and say, man, you need to get to Jesus as quickly as possible. Amen. 
In a few moments, there'll be preachers lined up down here to get you and explain to you a lot better than I ever can and ever will. But they'll explain to you what it means to come to God and for him to take your sins and to take you to him when you die. My second appeal is to my sleepy parishioners. You're too relaxed. There are things that are going, around, around, going on around you, and we need your help. We don't want to be fighting this battle by ourselves. I should not, and we should not, as workers here in the church, be standing here saying laborers are few in this crowd. If you're sleepy, it's time for you to wake up. Do not let the world pass you by and people die without Christ and it's going to be on your hands. Wake up and help us. Wake up, go tell somebody about the Christ who died for you. Don't be so selfish that you're okay and comfortable with Christ dying for you and you don't care about anybody else. It's not time to take a nap. It's time to wake up. Time to participate. Time to get in this thing. Wake up, parishioners that are sleepy. Then I have a third appeal. I'm appealing to those of you who are on the edge. I won't be harsh on you. Sometimes life halves its ebbs and flows. And sometimes we make decisions without God. And right now you're on the edge. You're getting ready to fall out of church and you're showing us some signs and nobody's really said anything about it, but I'm coming to tell you today, we see you and we love you and we'll accept you and we'll embrace you. Come down off the edge. Join in the mix. Come get close to some people that can be accountable. You can be accountable to. This portion takes people being real. You got to be real. Just say, hey, man, it's embarrassing, but I'm on the edge. It's okay. I've been on the edge. <laughs> God, he sends people to help you off the edge. They'll give you a loving hand, a loving arm, and get you down off of the edge. That's what we came for. That's what we're here for. We're not here to beat you across the head with the Bible. We want to show you that the Bible works. We want to show you that God is love. We want to show you that God has something planned for you and he wants to use you. So don't sit on the edge. Don't quit on God. Don't leave God. I want you to notice for those who are sitting on the edge, the Bible says that he failed. The Bible did not say that he jumped. His falling was unintentional. If you're on the edge, you might say, I'm fine on the edge, man. Just let me hang out on the edge. You go ahead, but you can fall. There's a man, you guys look it up, there's a man who made this statement. He was a tightrope walker. He said, I will never fall. Therefore, he took no safety equipment, nothing with him. Fell 300 feet to his death because he thought that he would never fall. Oh, just a few years after that, his grandson said the same thing. I would never fall. Look it up. Y'all don't believe me. Look it up. He said, I would never fall. He was a tightrope walker. And he followed in the footsteps of his granddad and said, I'm going to walk the tightrope too. And I'm not going to fall. I'm so good at this. I got so much balance. I can never fall. A little bit of wind came and blew. He fell to his death. All because he thought he would never fall. If you're on the edge this evening, I'm trying to plead with you. Be careful. We don't want you to fall off. We don't want you to fall out of church. It's not God's desire. It's not our church's desire for you to fall away from God, to fall out of church. It's just not our desire. We take no glory in that. 
We're not happy with that. Then my final appeal is to those of us who in times past have been aloof to people sitting on the edge. We're just going about our life, living it how we see fit. and We're not paying attention to people getting ready to fall out of church. But we've been in time past the ones who run up to the window and say, look at that, he fell out of the window. I knew he was going to fall. I didn't say nothing. I should have said something earlier. But it's too late then. If you've been aloof and you know people that are going to fall, you can go up to them and lovingly embrace them and say, hey, man, let me help you down off the edge. That's spirituality. That's being a grown man Christian. That's the hard work of the ministry. Helping people that fall. Helping people on the edge. Helping people on the edge. 